Renew, Bible principles and practical steps towards church revitalization. Session two, change. This course is called Renew, and this session is called Change. There can be no renewal without change. I've been working in a variety of churches for over 30 years, and it's my observation that most churches are rather resistant to change. Is this your view? And if yes, have you had any thoughts as to why this might be? You might choose to stop the video at this point and discuss question one in your study notes, or your group might prefer to consider all the questions at the end. I can think of quite a lot of reasons why churches seem reluctant to change, but I've whittled them down to four theological, human nature, inertia, and institutional. Number one, theological. This is another of those almost subconscious patterns of thought. It's rarely stated out loud, but I think it's important for us to consider it openly and then reject it if it's wrong. Malachi chapter three and verse six says this, I am the Lord, I do not change. And this is how the line of thought goes. If God doesn't change, and if his word doesn't change, and if the gospel doesn't change, then we don't need to change either. The logic is tragically flawed and entirely unbiblical, as we shall see. There are less churches that think like this than there used to be. I can probably name around 20 churches that used to think this way, but they don't think like this any longer because they've gone. They resisted change vehemently, but they ended up making maybe the most serious change of all, from open to closed. This is one of the underlying principles of change, that the longer you put it off, the more traumatic it is. Change should be continuous. Change should be incremental. That way, it's relatively painless. Number two, human nature. In general, people don't like change. In any population, about 20% will be risk-taking personality types who crave stimulation, get bored easily, and seek out change. At the other end of the bell-shaped distribution curve, the other 20% are strongly conservative. They take comfort in routine. They enjoy predictability. They are strongly change averse. And in the middle, the other 60% are shades in between, but overall, they are mildly change averse. Have you seen the story about the power station cooling towers at Ironbridge? They are being demolished and local people are protesting. They're local landmarks, they say. They're part of our industrial heritage. But when the towers were built in 1969, there were local protests too. We don't want those ugly things here. How could they build such monstrosities in such a beautiful part of the Upper Seven Rivers Valley? The two petitions against them being built and against them being knocked down, are 50 years apart. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of the same people signed them both. It's just human nature. We mostly don't like change. And churches are made up of people. Three, inertia. This is the word used in physics to describe the tendency of things to keep going the way that they are going. Have you considered the QWERTY keyboard? It was invented in the 1870s and the layout was arranged to solve a mechanical problem. On old typewriters the keys moved levers and on the end of the levers were individual letters that pressed an inked ribbon against the paper and printed the letter. When two levers came out in quick succession, they could jam. 
And so the most frequently used letters were distributed far apart around the keyboard. This is the reason for the QWERTY arrangement, to avoid key jams. But with the advent of the electric typewriter and then the computer, this physical reason has long gone. There's been no reason behind the QWERTY keyboard for 40 years, but we still use it because of inertia. It's important that we recognize that inertia operates in churches too. Things tend to go on in the same direction long after the reason for that has disappeared. 4. Institutional We will look more deeply at this in the session that covers decision making. But just to note in passing that many church institutions are biased against change. For example, if your church operates a congregational model where church members vote, it's quite likely that the younger and more radical people aren't members at all and won't be counted in that vote. And then of the people that you do have, 20% are change averse strongly and probably going to vote against almost anything, and the middle section will be mildly change averse. To get a radical change through your church meeting, you probably need two-thirds or three-quarters rather than a simple majority. And so the system is not set up to accommodate change, but rather to foster the way things are. You might choose to stop the video here and discuss resistance to change and the associated questions in your study notes. This is where we're going for the rest of the session. Hudson Taylor, Jesus, the Apostle Paul. Hudson Taylor went out to be a missionary in China in 1853. When he got there, he found that the missions had built compounds and were living inside them as if they were living in a little patch of England. The locals referred to the missionaries as black devils because the missionaries wore traditional English dark suits even though they were in China. Hudson Taylor deliberately moved out of the compound. He adopted Chinese dress, he learned their language, he shaved the front of his head and grew a pigtail the same as the natives. He was severely criticised mostly by other missionaries who said he had gone native. But he began to see more people come to faith in Jesus Christ than just about all the other missionaries put together. When we talk about change, we need to identify what we can change, what we can't change, and what we must change. Imagine you're a secretary. The boss dictates a letter and tells you to send it. Does it matter what kind of envelope you use? Not much. Does it matter if it's written on white paper or yellow paper? Not really. If it's typed, it's more business-like. If it's handwritten, it's more personal. But that's not critical. It's the words, the message that the boss has dictated directly to you that you can't change. We need to identify what we can change, what we can't change, and what we must change. For Hudson Taylor, the native dress, the hairstyle, was just the envelope. The message of the Gospel was the unchanging truth. Jesus. Hudson Taylor went from Yorkshire to China. Instead of English, he learned Chinese. Instead of an Englishman's suit, he wore the native dress. Hudson Taylor was following the example of Jesus. Jesus came from heaven. He learned our language. He spoke Aramaic and common man's Greek. He wore native clothes. Beyond all, he took human form. As Charles Wesley put it, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. Jesus' incarnation was so radical that Jesus is still human today. This from John Piper's website, Desiring God. For most people, it is obvious that Jesus will be God forever. But for some reason, it has escaped a lot of us that Jesus will also be man forever. Jesus is still man, 
right now, as you read this, and forever. Jesus is human. This is why understanding, I am the Lord, I do not change, as presenting God as eternally static, is so inadequate. The incarnation is an incomprehensibly radical change in the very nature of God. You might choose to stop the video here and discuss some of the issues raised and the next group of questions in your study notes. The Apostle Paul. Paul is not a man noted for his flexibility. His theology is often thought of as hardline and uncompromising. But when it comes to getting the message across, Paul considers flexibility to be essential. I have become all things to all people, he says, so that by all possible means I might save some. This is Paul being flexible and accommodating, doing everything he can to connect with the other person. To the Jews I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I become like one under the law to win those under the law. To the weak I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul is saying if there is a gap between you and me I will close it. I don't expect you to move, I will move. I don't expect you to change, I will change. I'm sure this made Paul deeply uncomfortable at times. I'm sure it took him well out of his comfort zone. But he says, I will step into your comfort zone if it means that you will hear this message. Notice that he says, by all possible means. Some means are impossible because they compromise the message. But Paul is saying, I'll put it in an envelope that you will find attractive and are likely to open. I'll put it in a language that you understand. I'll change the font, the paper size, the ink colour, anything to bridge the gap. Anything, says Paul, however uncomfortable it is for me, if it reaches you and doesn't compromise the message. Do you see how far this is from saying I like our church the way it is. I feel comfortable here. I want it to stay the way it is because it suits me. We should be saying, how does God feel about this church? Is it the way he wants it? Does the Holy Spirit feel comfortable here? These are the top priorities. And next, in terms of our communication of the gospel, Am I willing to abandon my own ease and comfort to change things the way that I like them in order to make it easier for those outside to feel comfortable here, for them to hear the message and connect with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I will become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel. This is not a manifesto for our ease or comfort. This is a manifesto for the self-sacrificing way of the cross. This is a manifesto for change.